30 minutes, I'll, okay. I'll make a quick... And then we can have some Q&A afterwards, can we? Yeah, by all means. Okay, people may be speaking for no very long, which is could be sure. a so never mind. <laughs> so over to you, Lorna and Sam. Thank you. So I'll give an introduction to the IDSI, which is the International Decision Support Initiative, and also to our team here at Imperial, which is the Global Health and Development Group. So the IDSI is a collaborative consortium of a number of institutions reaching all corners of the globe. So we have ourselves at Imperial. We work very closely with our partners, the Health Intervention Technology Assessment Program, or HITAP, of Thailand, with Priceless, based at Wits University in South Africa, and with the Center for Global Development in the US. So IDSI is an innovative platform of health expertise and cooperation, forging partnerships between North, South, and South, South. We draw on our vast experience and track record within the NHS, and our team was formerly part of NICE here in the UK and NICE International, and we've now recently moved into Imperial College as the Global Health and Development Group. So we draw on those close ties with NICE, as well as other NHS practitioner experience, and the wider experience of the partners here at the Institute of Global Health Innovation, as well as from our collaborative expertise in all of our other partner institutions. We're primarily funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also receive significant funding from the Department for International Development and Rockefeller. So a few points here that we've put and why we feel that we're unique as a collaborative network. So we respond to policymaker demands. We also provide practical support to country and decision makers and work alongside local teams. And this ensures sustainability on the ground and building stronger systems. We're an international and multidisciplinary network, and we also produce knowledge products, and these are produced free of charge and widely available, and I'll show you later where you can find those. So at the core of what we do is advocating for more health to be bought from the money available within any finite health budget, and this is what we call priority setting. So I've got a video here that was developed by our partners at the Centre for Global Development, which nicely illustrates this. Imagine you work for a global health funding agency focused on combat... Imagine you work for a global health funding agency focused on combating malaria in rural Africa. Each year, you exhaust your budget on bed nets, spraying, diagnostics, and medication. Still, you're only able to deliver these life-saving commodities to half the people in need. With no additional funds available, how would you stretch your resources to save more lives? This is a question that global health funders face today and millions of lives hang in the balance. Each year, more than three million people die preventable deaths from AIDS, TB, and malaria. 
That's more than the population of Paris. Yet foreign assistance for health has leveled off in recent years. Governments and funders are now, more than ever, faced with an urgent challenge to maximize the health impact of every available peso, pound, and pula. This is what we call value for money. It's not about reducing costs or cutting budgets, but about getting the best ROI possible, the absolute most health for the money. Simple, right? Not quite. Global health funders and implementers operate in a complex environment where perverse incentives often stand between money spent and impact on people's health. Most grants are negotiated and agreed upon by funders and implementers to support a country's global health agenda. So let's start there. There are four domains within a grant cycle where incentives can be improved to get more health for money. Allocation, contracts, costs and spending, and verification. Let's look at common problems a bed net distribution program might face and how better decisions in each domain could help address these problems. Currently, funding goes to over 200 different types of bed nets, though research proves that only a few types are more effective and less expensive than the others. Alternatively, funders could ask countries to purchase bed nets from a set menu of proven cost-effective types. At the contract stage, bed nets may be included in the budget, but no incentives, financial or non-financial, are built into the grant agreement to ensure they are distributed and used properly. To get more health for the money, contracts should connect a portion of funding to incremental progress on measurable goals, like the number of children sleeping under bed nets. At the costs and spending stage, Supply chains may be slow, inefficient, and expensive to move a bed net from warehouses to frontline providers. And program managers often don't have data in real time to deal with these problems. Products may get lost, stolen, or expire before reaching their destination. To improve this, funders could increase and expand reporting to commodity price tracking systems to ensure bed nets arrive in the right place at the right time for the right price. At the verification stage, funders often get flimsy self-reported data on the use and distribution of bed nets. Whenever possible, funders should use more rigorous methods to collect performance data and rely on third-party verification of data to ensure its accuracy. This data can inform every stage of grant cycle and strengthen the overall impact of the bed net distribution program over time. Modest changes like these will free up millions of dollars that can be reinvested to save millions more lives. This is what we mean by more health for the money. From the Global Fund Secretariat in Geneva, to the Office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator in Washington, D.C., to the Department for International Development in London, to hospitals in Nigeria and civil society organizations like the Center for Global Development, everyone bears some responsibility for improving value for money and everyone will benefit. So I think that demonstrates nicely the conundrum that many policymakers across the world face, whereby whether you are in a low, middle, or high-income country, there is a finite budget dedicated towards health, and therefore you need to engage in some form of priority setting in order to understand what you are going to allocate those budgets towards. So whether that be for resources, for infrastructure, for particular drugs, and how you make those decisions is something that we provide policymakers with the tools to do. So our mission is to guide decision makers towards more effective and efficient healthcare resource allocation strategies with the ultimate gain of improving population health. So with that in mind, the ultimate goal of most countries is to achieve universal health coverage. And this is laid out as part of the Sustainable Vet Development Goals by the United Nations, particularly looking at goal number three. And it, universal health coverage really relates to providing financial risk protection for people and ensuring that they have access to quality, essential healthcare services that is safe and affordable for everyone. So while in an ideal world, all people would be provided with all the healthcare needs that they have for free, However, we know that this doesn't happen and that there are always going to be resource constraints around what governments can provide. And this means that a balancing act needs to happen between uh, different dimensions that policymakers can consider. 
and this can be broken down primarily into costs, services and population. So in the UK, we're lucky enough to have the National Health Service, which provides almost all of the care that we do need, free at cost, free at the point of delivery, apart from prescription charges for some people and dental care, and to the entire population. Looking conversely at countries like India, they have a social insurance program called RSVY, which covers a large proportion of costs only for tertiary care services, surgical procedures such as a hernia operation or a hysterectomy, and only for the population below the poverty line. So this is the way in which they've decided to balance those funds. And whether that's successful or not is, is yet to be seen, but the resounding answer is likely no. So our team lies essentially in the middle of the evidence to policy continuum. We provide a bridge between the best quality evidence and the implementation of that into evidence-based policy decisions. And the way we do this is to support the development of certain products like clinical guidelines and pathways based on the best available evidence, to assist in capacity building for health economics and help local institutions develop a reference case by which they can make decisions as to whether different interventions are cost effective. We also help to inform different health benefits packages and in essential medicines lists. So in essence, the IDSI shares experiences, showcases lessons learned, and identifies practical ways to scale up technical support for more systematic, fair, and evidence-informed priority setting processes. Underpinning what we do is what we call the IDSI theory of change, and this essentially allows us to monitor and evaluate our progress against the ultimate goal of achieving better health. So we establish effective partnerships through providing strategic support and knowledge products. We strengthen country institutions through helping them implement uh, evidence-based rules and norms for how decisions are made. Hopefully this leads to better decisions being made within the health policy space with the ultimate goal of achieving better health. So to give some more background into our team specifically, our mission is to contribute to better health around the world through more effective and equitable use of resources. We provide advice and consultancy to decision makers on priority setting towards universal health coverage. Our ultimate goal again is towards health system strengthening and we draw on our UK and global knowledge of health systems. We're led by Calypso Chalkadi, who you can see in the middle there, and our co Associate Director Francoise Pousset in the back right, also seen in the audience here. So we have engaged to some extent with a large number of countries. You can see the different coloured panels here indicate the level of engagement that we have had. And to give you a bit of a flavour of some of the work that we've done, which can be broken down broadly into value for money, guidelines and pay for performance. Again, with the ultimate goal of universal health coverage and improving the way that priorities are made. So in India and South Africa, we have uh, assisted local government in terms of improving the way priorities are set through implementing a system of health technology assessment. In Vietnam and India again, we've also helped to contextualize local evidence and bring that together in a synthesized way in order to develop local standard treatment guidelines and quality standards. And we've also engaged with the government of China and Thailand in order to develop a framework for uh, quality outcomes, in order to improve the way that data is captured and that quality uh, metrics can be studied. So more specifically, one of the uh, programs that we've recently been involved with, led by my colleague Dr. Ryan Lee, is to develop quality standards for antimicrobial resistance in Vietnam. So antimicrobial resistance has been estimated by the year 2030 to be the highest cause of mortality. This is extremely scary and something that global health community is looking to address at present. So what Ryan and the team has done is establish quality standards for improving or reducing inappropriate prescribing practices in Vietnam. The piece was recently published in The Lancet here where you can see that not only is this improve enga engagement in Vietnam, but the local evidence engagement and contextualization are critical for transforming global discourse on antimicrobial resistance and ways in which this can be combated. In India, we have a number of programs of work, as I've mentioned, developing a system for 
health technology assessment, which is the way in which priorities can be explicitly set and taken into account equity considerations as well as the evidence. We've developed standard treatment guidelines in 12 key clinical priority areas. We've also helped to inform clinical pathways that feed into the National Health Insurance Program. And also specifically working at the state level, we've developed quality standards for improving maternal care and reducing postpartum hemorrhage. So just a few achievements here that I've listed from a team that has been incredibly successful since its inception. And I can say that as someone that's only been here for a couple of years or so, and the team established in 2009. We've raised close to $25 million in grant revenue. We've worked in over 60 countries. We've formed delivery networks such as the IDSI, drawing from collaborative partners across the globe, and attracted the first and one of the largest ever single Gates grants to support healthcare decision making in low and middle income countries. We've also spearheaded the local government's commitment through supporting British institutions to playing their role towards international development. Quick plug for some of our resources here. You can visit our website where we have different pages dedicated to each of the countries in which we work. We also have links to various knowledge products that have been produced by us, as well as many of our global partners. And we also write a blog, which we update quite frequently on the different events that we engage in and updates on the work that we're doing around the world. That's us. Thank you.
So, so the plane goes by, I get by and he still gets up to the nose and goes through. Yeah. Well, is it Thank you, Tony, for the very kind introduction. It's indeed a pleasure to be here today. And as you might have heard from Tony's introduction, I'm half doctor, half economist, which makes me a kind of schizophrenic. So please excuse me if you have elements, see elements of schizophrenia in presentation today. Well, that's the title of my talk, Being Sustainable and Smart, The Wind Strategy for Universal Healthcare in India. And I hope to spend the next 45 minutes with you talking to this structure. Firstly, let me talk briefly about the university, which I belong to, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, the department from which I come from, the School of Health System Studies, and the Center for Health Policy Planning and Management. After which, I move into certain issues related to the transition from MDGs to SDGs and what it means for us. From which, I move to universal health care, specifically to the Indian research context and the challenges which Indian researchers face when they try to do research related to health policy. From which I moved to a model which we developed in our institute called the field practical model, field practical model to address this challenge, which is related to converting data to decision. After which I moved on to the larger ambit of UHC in India and certain lesson, lessons for India. From this, I take data from the Global Burden of Disease Study as well as certain economic evaluation studies and create what I call a smart goal and the win strategy for India. I end my talk talking of the role of academic and research institutes and what we mean by apps and a possible UHC model for India. This is the entrance to my institute in Mumbai. If you ever do visit Mumbai and you want a breath of fresh air, just enter our institute. It has over a thousand trees, something which is very missing in Mumbai. We don't see green spaces in Mumbai. It was established in 1936 by a generous grant from the Tata uh, Trust. The Tata is a household name globally and in the world as well as in India. They are a corporate body and they are a trust. They give us money for the land and they also give us money for setting up or building the infrastructure in the building way back in 1936. But we are not a private institute. We are an autonomous university under the University Grants Commission of the Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India. 
The word autonomous is very important because if the ministry wants to poke its nose and interfere, we raise our hands and tell them, sorry, we are autonomous. And when we want to get our work done, we tell the ministry, we are part of the ministry, so please help us, right? So it helps us in getting the work done either way. We have faculty strength of over 250, multidisciplinary. We have a mix of epidemiologists, doctors, sociologists, economists, uh, demographers, a whole range of things. We have four campus, and as Tony rightly said, our main campus is in Mumbai, but we also have a campus in the northeast of the country, Guwahati, uh, south, which is Hyderabad, and Tujapur, which is centrally located. We offer 38 master's programs, 12 doctorate programs, and we have over 2,000 students. Uh, Laura told me about the size of Imperial today afternoon, and I must dare to be much smaller than Imperial. Okay, so we are much smaller than Imperial, but within the country we are quite a force. We have 18 schools, we, which was previously called as centers, 37 centers within the school, and six independent centers. The schools anchor the teaching programs, while the center anchor a research direction or research themes for development. And the department, which I belong to, the School of Health System Studies, is a relatively young department within a pretty old institute established in 1989. And the center is even younger. It was established in 2004. So this is in brief about my university, my department, and my center. Now coming to the talk or the path on MDGs to SDGs. And I put this slide because sometimes I feel it's important to look into the past to understand the future. And the cyclical representation of the slide denotes the fact that the global commitments like the world seem to be moving in a cycle. When I think of SDGs, the first thought when I go back into history is, which comes to my mind is the Health for All, Almata Declaration in 1978 which talked of certain goals to be set. Then came the Millennium Development Goals to the UN Special General Assembly in 2000 for goals to be created or to be achieved by 2015. And then today we all, all are talking of sustainable development to be achieved by 2015. And I'll end my presentation with certain thoughts on possibly what might happen after 2015. Health for all, comparative we had one goal for health for all, 12 targets, 19 indicators, which India and many countries in the world did not achieve. Then came the MDGs with eight goals, 18 targets, 48 indicators, which again India did not achieve. And today we are looking at 17 goals, 169 targets, and the number of indicators yet to be decided. So I asked myself the question, is this move from MDG to SDG a smart move? And I use the word SMART as an acronym in terms of specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. Let me share some of my thoughts on this. In terms of the first three, specific, measurable, and achievable. It took three years for the SDG document to be signed. It is a legally binding document, unlike the MDG document. But it took three years because the countries and the representatives of the countries wanted the right words to be in place. But in getting the words right, if it took three years, I shudder to think in terms of the implementation of those words, how long would it take? And that's my first concern, the practicality in terms of the enforcement mechanism, in terms of implementation of what has been written down in that document. I take the example of the Kyoto Protocol, a very good legally binding document, but very poorly enforced because lack of proper effective enforcement mechanisms. The second issue I see with the SDGs is we don't have intermediate targets. Except for the road traffic accident target, most of the targets, in fact, all the other targets of the SDGs are about 2030. A politician is not interested in 2030. A politician is interested in what happens in the next five years. Where are the five-year targets in the SDGs? I ask this question. Where is the incentive to the politician for the political will to be generated to move towards any of these goals or these targets? So I think that is another problem. Ownership. Everyone's responsibility can become no one's responsibility. And why I say that is, Laura showed this slide a couple of minutes ago. You have 17 
different colored boxes for sustainable development goals, my concern is I don't see the common color. Is or is there really asking us to verticalize our targets or verticalize our strategies, you know, poverty, subject, hunger, health, education, gender, but we know they're all linked. And if we visualize these, each of these goals would probably be a part of a particular department within a particular ministry. Now, who owns the overall sustainable development goals? And that's where I see that everyone's responsibility can perhaps become no one's responsibility. The good news, it's all not that bad in terms of the relevance and the timeliness. This is data from the Good Health Research, Good Earth Research, sorry, where they say that human impact is measured as a multiplication factor of population, affluence, and technology. And what does the research say? That between 1900 and 2015, technology measured in the terms of patents has a, an affluence measured in terms of consumption have overcome human population as a driver of impact. That means for the first time, we are looking at consumption overtaking the needs, or rather greed overcoming need. As Gandhi said, there's enough in this world for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. But this data is clearly telling us that greed has overcome need. And then sustainability becomes a question. Because if you are consuming today at such a large extent, what is left for the next generation to use? Hence, I would feel relevance and time are definitely in terms of the SDGs are very important parameters and definitely they are being relevant and timely. Now, I would focus on the goal three, the good health, which of course translates into universal health care and universal health care coverage. Well, you've all heard of this. Universal health care comprises financial risk protection. That means are we able to prevent the population from spending out of pocket when they go to the health sector, go to the health facilities. But there's no point in providing financial risk protection if there's no access to the health care services. You can have a community or a village having health insurance, but if the nearest health care center is 100 miles away, it's not universal health care. And what's the point of providing that access to that health service if the person goes there and finds that there is no doctor or skilled manpower to provide basic services. We don't have improved health outcomes. Hence, all three are interlinked and all three are very vital for universal health care coverage. What does universal health care coverage translate into in terms of research questions? I used this poster from the World Health Organization to try to help understand this. The first question is, can you get help from a well-trained health worker? Right? So in terms of availability of health workers. Can you get treatment that helps you get better and be safe, quality of healthcare services? Can you get the medicines and other health products you need? Devil will say medicines and drugs. Who will pay for it? Financial risk protection. Are there policies in place to make quality services available for everyone and every time? Quality services. And the last question on which I will spend some time is does your government have the information it needs to make the right decisions about the whole system. And this is the area of which we talked of before, evidence for decisions or evidence-based policy making. Do you have the data? Secondly, the second question is, is the data being used to make the right decisions? And I think it is this movement which is very well reflected in the statement by W. Edward Deming. In God we trust, all others must bring data. And I think it's a very important statement which tells us about the importance of data today in taking decisions. This is the global context. In the Indian context, I change the statement. In God, we must trust because all others bring relevancy. Unfortunately, this is a statement which shows or gives a picture of the political, social, cultural, and decision-making environment in India. And remember, data is just one side of the equation. We have the decisions on the other side. So we have a population in India which is not very data-driven. We have policymakers making decisions which are not evidence-based. And the poor researcher who is supposed to collect the data thinks what's the use of collecting the data because the data is not being used by anybody. 
either for the population or for the decision making. So this is what I call as the dual challenge. The data challenge in India in terms of generating good quality, credible data. And the second is the decision challenge in terms of making the data or using the data for effective decisions. In this context, I was sent to the London School of Economics to do my master's in international health policy. And my professor showed me this slide, slide in, of policy making. And any of you might be familiar with this particular slide. It's a very clean slide, wherein my professor said that policy making has a cyclical flow of various events, starting with agenda setting, policy formulation, decision making, policy implementation, monitoring and evaluation. But most importantly, you have research at the center. And research is the data or that evidence which feeds into each stage of research. But very quickly, he moved on to this. And then he said, that was the ideal world and this is the real world. And hence, policy making in the real world is much more complex. You see a web of interactions happening and different stakeholders and players coming into play when we want to use data for decision. You can still see the cycle in this. You can still see the research from there. But then you have a lot of other players, like you have the cabinet, the parliament, the ministry, the private sector, the civil society, and the donors which come into play. And you can add on to this mix. So having learned this, when I returned to India and started doing research related to policy making, the spider's web had turned into an elephant. And this is a slide which I try to tell you through this slide some of the key challenges which we as researchers in India face when we are trying to do research related to policy making. I'll start with the foot of the elephant, the red tape, very famous, the bureaucracy of India, the political culture and bureaucracy. It sometimes takes more time to actually get a research started off than actually doing the work of the research. You know. Perhaps that's the only time, in, only place in the world where it happens. The second point, non-engagement with local research institutes and NGOs. Very unfortunate. I've been here in the UK for the last few months, and I was very pleased to learn that the starting point of the NICE, the Na National Institute of Clinical and Health Excellence, was an initiative taken by the politicians to actually engage research universities to provide the evidence for decision. It just doesn't happen in India. The engagement is very weak. Research credibility and the role of media, I believe, are universal challenges, not specific to India. Societal disconnect and power relations is linked to the non-engagement which happens. The long duration of research is an inherent problem in research itself. Because when we want to do research, we want to do with a strong methodological rigor which takes time. But a policy maker or a decision maker is someone who cannot afford time. They need quick evidence for quick decisions. And so there's an introduction, there's an inherent paradox or contradiction here is whether a research whether we can do credible research within a short period of time, provide that credible evidence for good decision and lack or improper communication. We as researchers are trained to write very good papers, which is very good, which has very good academic jargon. They don't make sense to a policy maker. Nobody is going to understand our curves or threshold levels or our uh, whatever you call it, fancy diagrams which we use or statistical analysis unless we convert it into a language which they can understand. And hence, I think the lack or improper communication is another reason why we might generate a lot of evidence as research or academic universities, but not much of that gets converted into a decision making or gets converted into decisions. So we try to address some of these challenges <coughs> sorry, by creating the data to decision or the field practical model. We have a full-time two years master's program at our institute called the MPH in Health Policy Economics and Finance. And what we did was to keep the field practicum model ingrained within this particular master's program. So this is how the structure of the curriculum looks. The students enter here the first semester, which is in which they are taught courses related to quantitative, qualitative research, policy analysis, pharmacoeconomics, economics evaluation, and then the second semester is also taught course. And then in the third semester is where they go for the field practicum, which is the practical application of what they have learned in the first year. How was this model developed? 
Again, it was a very slow and painstaking process of brainstorming workshops with a range of stakeholders whom we felt were relevant for this. Academicians, researchers, program planners, implementers, civil servants, NGOs, state government representatives. And then what we created was a kind of a standard operating procedure document. How does the process work? It's easy to understand this process if you think of an arranged marriage scenario in the Indian situation. You first have a preparatory phase, and that's a very critical part of this particular engagement, wherein the faculty members are allotted to a particular student, and the discussion with respective state policy makers happen at that particular point in time. So this engagement becomes critical for the faculty member and the student and the state policy maker to understand each other and to identify a problem or an issue which the state policy maker feels is an issue of concern. I think that's the critical element. The issue is identified by the health system person and not by the researcher. Then follows the implementation phase between June to October, wherein they create a concept note in the first two weeks, which is the conceptualization. Then the actual field work starts, which is the situation assessment, the gap analysis using primary, secondary data, and stakeholder analysis, followed by a midterm review, wherein they are come called back to the university and they present the findings which they have done, which is the finding related to situation assessment and the gap analysis. At the end of this midterm review, they are supposed to create a set of recommendations which they take back to the stakeholders in the next four weeks and discuss with the stakeholders in terms of its practicality and feasibility. And once that is done and there is a consensus between the stakeholders and in terms of what is practical and feasible, the end product is actually a policy brief and not a result research dissertation. And how does this differ from a research or a dissertation is, it's a very action-oriented document. It's front-loaded. And remember, the aim of this is application of knowledge for problem solving. The aim is not to generate new knowledge, right? Recommendation focus, more professional, less academic, evidence-based, precise, concise, understandable, and practical and feasible. These distinguish a policy brief from any other research document. So if you remember the slide of the elephant, <coughs> I mentioned to you some of the challenges which we faced. Now let me, through this slide, try to make or help understand how we address some of these challenges. One of the challenges I had said was non-engagement. We address that by ensuring a consultation and discussion between the researchers and policy makers and implementers throughout the process. The challenge of time, 18 weeks. This product or the policy brief or the working paper had to come up within 18 weeks. So hence, the challenge of time was also addressed to this. The disconnect was addressed by ensuring that the issue was identified by the policy maker. The policy maker here could be the health secretary or a program implementer in this case. Research credibility was ensured because it was a 10 credit compulsory academic requirement for the students and hence they would be evaluated on it and they would be mentored by the academy. The communication gap was addressed by converting the academic jargon into a policy brief or into a language which the policy makers understood. This slide is pretty loaded, but just to tell you that we had a range of issues <coughs> which we were able to cover through this model, which included communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, uh, operational issues, telemedicine, public health partnerships, cancer, uh, diabetes. And if you look at the right side, the location, we covered quite different states in the country. I've just circled them over here. So we have states in the north, we have states in the east, states in the center, and we also have states in the south. So each state at the end of 15 weeks got a policy brief document created of a particular issue which that respective state policy maker had, had identified as being important. What did it cost us? Well, it cost us little. It was mainly the students who spent, and some of the students got the money reimbursed from our own university. So it was approximately 60 to 120 US pounds for this approach. And what did it cost the state? Zero. There was no, absolutely zero expenditure of the state in this creation of the policy. So what did we learn from this particular model? I think the first lesson we learn is 
a proactive academic research initiative works better in India than waiting for the state to be proactive. Okay. Secondly, working with respective state level decision makers is, a more, is more useful as health is a state setting. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Indian federal structure. We have 29 states in India, but health is a state subject. So decisions of health are taken by the state and the central government may take a decision, but the state government is not obliged to accept that decision. Hence, for practical purposes and engagement, the state government makes the decision more implementable. Okay. It helps understand the key issues for decision from the policymaker's perspective. It converts the academic jargon of research into simplified form of policy views. Health design research is timely, focused, credible, and I think the key word here is ownership. Once the state policymaker of the state feels there is an ownership in this work, it would help in implementation. I think that's another key lesson we learn. Right. Now I move on to the broader issue of universal health care in India. And you've seen this cube, Laura presented it some time back. It's the same, it's a universal cube, sometimes called also as the Pandora's box. If we talk of India, if you look at perhaps India being in the box, colored box here, so the question we need to ask is, what is the level of population we have covered? Maybe the coverage is today more towards the urban areas and we need to cover more rural and tribal areas. When you're looking at services, perhaps we are covering more of the tertiary care services, we need to cover more primary and secondary care services. And we are, when we're looking at cost of services, are we in a position or what extent are we able to reduce the cost sharing and fee? So the financial protection, services and the population who is covered becomes the three critical questions. And what is the Indian scenario in this? Firstly, very poor public expenditure on health. Historically, since independence, our public expenditure on health has covered around 1% of the GDP, which is very low. But I'll argue that that's not the problem. And I'll come to that later on. It's not the amount of expenditure, it's the inefficient expenditure which is the problem. The second issue we have is the mix of public and private providers for which the private providers predominate. And that creates a very fragmented healthcare system in the country. Those who can afford healthcare go to the private to get the best of care which is comparable to the best in the world, while those who are poor will have to go to the public healthcare system which is becoming weak, weakened, which is weakened day by day. So the quality of services in the public healthcare system has deteriorated over the years. It results in huge out-of-pocket payments. Every state has brought out certain state-specific insurance scheme. Even we talk of, uh, we heard of RSBY at the national level. But again, they cover only a certain section of the population, and out-of-pocket payments are still high. The World Bank estimates that 25% of India's population is pushed below poverty line just because of hospitalization expenses. And if we disaggregate the data based on different states in the country, the data would be 44% for Bihar, and it would be less perhaps for Tamil Nadu. But there's a huge variation in terms of how much is the medical poverty trap of India. And that brings me to the next point that India is picking at a different stage or at different levels of achievement. So it's not a bad story totally. We have certain states in the south like Tamil Nadu and Kerala which have did pretty well, while you have states in the north which are perhaps not doing so well. And the next point I want to tell you is India is also facing what is called as the double burden of disease, the changing disease epidemic. So if we have to look at this box, and we, we have this context in mind, my opinion is we need to prioritize. We cannot just do everything for everybody. And then comes the key question is how do we prioritize? So I look at two possible disciplines in science which can perhaps help prioritize. One is epidemiological evidence, the other is the economic evaluation evidence. What does the epidemiological evidence tell us? This is taken from the global burden of disease data. And I just want to show you the trend, the change in trend between <coughs> the ranking of diseases in terms of values per the 100,000. And if we just focus our attention on these arrows, diseases, the ranks which have gone up between 1990 and 2015, cardiovascular disease has gone up, other non-communicable disease has gone up, Diabetes has gone up, mental disorders have gone up, and musculoskeletal disorders have gone up. 
if we are not uh, convinced with values, if we look at the data again from the same source in terms of deaths per 100,000 and the ranking and compare the ranking between 1990 and 2015, you see a similar trend. Cardiovascular diseases, chronic respiratory diseases, diabetes has shot up, neoplasm have also increased. So definitely we see a trend of non-communicable diseases coming up in a big way in a country which is already grappling with communicable diseases, which have not gone away. And what does the economic evaluation look like? I refer to the Copenhagen Consensus Center study, and they did a cost-benefit analysis of the 169 SDG targets and found that 19 of these SDG targets are actually giving four times more benefit. And hence, according to them, these 19 targets, this uh, 19 of the 169 targets, uh, right, sorry, there's a mistake here. Nine of these 19, uh, nine of these 19 are directly calculated. This should be missed. Yeah, nine of these 19, that's right. So you have 19 targets of the 169, which are having four times more benefit, and nine of these 19 targets are directly calculated. I'll first take you through the 19 targets, which they say are the most cost benefit or give the most cost effectiveness. One is the lowering of the chronic child malnutrition. Then you have malaria, tuberculosis deaths, HIV infection control, early death from chronic disease, that's the NCD burden, reducing newborn mortality, increased immunization, improving family planning, eliminating violence against women and girls, phase out fossil fuel subsidies, decreased coral reef loss by half, tax pollution damage from energy, cutting indoor air pollution, reduced trade restrictions, improved gender equality, boost agricultural yield, yield increased girls' education, achieve universal primary education in sub-Saharan Africa and increase free schools in sub-Saharan Africa by twofold. So these are the 19 smart targets of which these are the nine targets which are directly calculated. The malnutrition target, the malaria target, TB target, HIV, chronic disease target, newborn mortality, immunization, family planning, and the indoor air pollution. So based on these two parameters, the epidemiological evidence and the economic evaluation, I would like to suggest some lessons for universal health care in India. The first lesson I would like to share with this audience is, one is we cannot have a standard operating procedure for universal health care in India. If you're looking at universal health care for the entire India, you have to approach it state-wise. Health is a state subject. Every state is in a different level of development. Every state has a different socio, political, cultural, economic context. And each state has to make its own plans based on that context. But what you're perhaps going to see between 2015 and 2030 is the world being divided into different kind of SOPs. And this is on a lighter note, the skeptics, the op optimists, and the pessimists. People, the academicians, if you look at the literature, if they're writing, you would easily be able to identify whether they're skeptic, the optimist, or the pessimist, and even in terms of the program planners and executives. Action should speak louder than words, the lesson two. Knowledge is potential power. But people say knowledge is power, but I say it's only potential power, unless one were to take action. When I look at the library at CIS and I see the volumes of dissertations and books lying there, I sometimes wonder how much of that has actually been converted into a decision or into something which made a change in the society around them. And in fact, that was the starting point for our discussion on the field practicum model itself. The knowledge is there, but what's the use of it getting just sitting just in a library? And hence, the evidence-based policy and the data-driven action becomes very key for universal healthcare in India. And the model I shared with you is one example of that. The third lesson is taking from what the data I showed you in terms of the smart targets for India. If you had seen, I have told you that there were nine smart targets, but I have modified them into seven in Indian terms. One is I have plugged child undernutrition and NCDs together. So that's because there's enough robust medical evidence to show that undernutrition in children is a risk factor for diabetes and heart disease in adulthood. So if we are able to tackle undernutrition in children, we automatically 
prevent these people from getting NCDs in adult it's killing two birds with one stone and I have removed the target for HIV for India because India has achieved HIV control so we don't need to really prioritize it at this point in time and of course the <coughs> strategy proposed was circumcision which may not be culturally accepted in India this is a controversial lesson PPP stands for in Indian context public private partnership I recently read a BBC or heard a BBC documentary uh, that Virgin is taking over some primary care trust in India and in, in sorry in NHS over here so uh, it's a kind of a model which we have experimented in India where primary health centers were given to NGOs when I say private state I also include NGOs and the, the multinational private companies are not going to the rural areas of the country so when you have PPP models in India you will see big hospitals, tertiary care hospitals, where the, the government has given money to the private enterprise and they are running the hospitals. So the money is going to the private players and it's not helping the population at all. But when we do a research on successful PPP models, the lesson we learn is that those PPPs which had good stewardship, good monitoring and good uh, uh, regulations in place were successful. So it's not that PPP cannot work. If you have a strong regulation in place, strong monitoring in place, then you can have a PPP functioning. And a new PPP, what we need for sustainable development goals is a PPP looking at people, looking at the planet, and looking at prosperity. That's the new PPP. The fifth lesson I wanted to share with you was investing in wind. I looked at the Invest in India website. The first comes up is automobiles. The second one is automobile parts. Third is aviation. I got a bit startled, then I realized it was in alphabetical order. So I scrolled down, I found education. I clicked on it, it said the page is still in the making. Then I clicked on healthcare, even that page was in the making. Where do we invest in India if we want to have universal health? That's the question I asked. If we want to make or achieve or go towards universal healthcare, I think the first investment is in women. Countries which achieve universal health care or good health at low cost, countries like Sri Lanka, Costa Rica, have done it by investment in women. Women empowerment is the key. Today, India, the female education is still very low, and the female contribution to the workforce is still extremely low. I think that's a huge potential we need to look at and invest in if we want to make progress towards universal health care coverage. I is infrastructure. We did a study in our institute to find out why doctors are not going to rural areas in India. It's a very common problem in India. Doctors prefer to work in urban areas. The reason was not salaries. The reason was they said there was not enough connectivity, no roads, no electricity, no schools for their children. So it's an infrastructure issue. Thailand achieved universal health care by first investing in roads and electrification of its villages. We need to learn a lesson from Thailand and invest in that kind of infrastructure which will improve health. And nutrition, I've already stressed. Undernutrition will tackle both undernutrition in childhood and diabetes and coronary heart disease in adults. Activating acts. This is a message for the academic and research institutes in the country and globally. If the, the academic and research institutes want to do something relevant universal health care I think there are four domains which they need to activate one is action research research which leads to certain decisions and action in the field research not just for knowledge generation perhaps the field practicum model I showed you was an example of an action research worth exploring and doing in other research, research institutes across India collaborative research there are many institutes in the country doing different bits and pieces of work but there is a very poor network of these institutes coming together, collaborating or creating a consortium in India. Very unfortunate situation. And I think that's another area we need to explore and invest in, in terms of activating that act. Translational research, from the lab to the bench to the community. Investment in lab research and basic science research in India is very, very poor. I perhaps the policymakers don't have the vision to understand that this is where the future lies. And perhaps that's where we 
are perhaps lacking and not able to do or reach towards the universal health. And surveillance, discontinuous monitoring, and keeping interaction wherein you have the existing public health programs in place, evaluate, monitor, and take immediate action for correction based on what the monitoring says. So I think that acts domain is very important. And this <coughs> has been, I must admit, a bit influenced by the Thailand Triangle. I don't know how many have heard the statement in triangle that a triangle which moves the mountain. In triangle, they say that Thailand achieved UHC because they had a triangle which moved the, uh, moved the mountain. The mountain means the hurdles and the challenges, right? But I modified the triangle from the Thailand model. The Thailand model had the government, the academia, and the civil society as the three corners of the triangle. In the Indian context, the civil society really doesn't have much of a voice. They are there in the middle with very little voice. So government has voice, academia has vo some voice, and the private sector has the maximum voice. But what's happening currently, the academia is, quite, is kind of in its own ivory tower with very little interaction happening with the government. The private sector is very active, interacts very powerfully with the government, gives the money, and hence the government always sometimes take, uh, usually takes the path least resistance. And hence, when you see the policies historically in terms of, uh, in India, you see a lot of policies favoring private sector involvement in health. If this is the situation, the triangle will never move. No. You need to convert this triangle into ball, wherein the government, the private sector, and academia start speaking the same language, and which is the voice of the people. Only if that happens, we will see the ball rolling for universal health care in India. So to conclude, universal health care, I believe, is essential for the post-2015 development agenda. Financing universal health care I have some data with me, and the point I'm trying to make is the 1% GDP is not the problem, expenditure, public health expenditure on health. We need the efficient public health expenditure on health. The, there's an estimate by the Ministry of Health which says that the UHC rollout would cost around $26 billion over the next four years. This is an estimate from 2015 to 2019. Roughly, it translates into $6.5 billion per year for the UHC rollout in India. India's GDP as per the World Bank data is $2.25 trillion, which is 2250 billion. If I do a simple mathematics, as per the ministry estimate, we need to spend only 0.2% of our GDP to roll out the UHC program. We're already spending 1% of GDP. What's happening? Corruption, mismatch priorities, <coughs> private sector gain, questions to think about. Hence, efficiency is the key. Priority setting for UHC, the, the SDG stands for the Smart Development Goal and the WIN Strategy, which was heard. Reduce, reduce inequalities. I think it's very unfortunate that the country which gave birth to Gandhi doesn't follow, follow Gandhi's thought. Gandhi had given a very important talisman, saying that when in doubt about what decision or action to take, Think of the most vulnerable, poor, weakest section, or weakest person you ever met in your life. And ask yourself if the action you take is going to make a difference to that person's life. If the answer is yes, take that decision and do that action. If the answer is no, don't take that action. It's not only the politicians, we blame the politicians. If every one of us starts applying Gandhi's thoughts, I think the world will be a better place to live in. Measure progress for UHC, robust data generation, and use of health management information systems. And obviously, last but not the least, good governance and overarching stewardship. Very essential for success. Today, on 24th November, I make some predictions for 2030. You can look back at this slide in 2030. And whether I'm right or wrong, you will, not, you will remember me. Right. One is, you will see between today and 2030 massive information related to SDG. That is probably guaranteed. Students here will see the professors writing, professors' colleagues will be writing. You can divide them into steps of each academic specific. You're going to see countries at various stages of achievement of the SDGs and UHC. And I dare say today, perhaps you might set, set a new set of goals after 2030. And final note, I believe universal healthcare is not a destination, but a journey 
of the greatest closure to help for all, that is everybody achieving a state of highest mental, social, and spiritual, and well, mental well-being. Physical, mental, social, and spiritual well-being. So that was the goal set in Alma Arta in 1978. We talk of the same in different words, in different languages, different diagrams, but they're still not the same. It's a journey, and we all have to be part of it. Thank you very much for your patience. And, and uh, you've covered a, a great deal there. Um, I, I'd just perhaps like to challenge, though, if I may, the, the sort of the notion that a lack of public financing isn't the big issue uh, in India. Um, you mentioned one percent of GDP, with Indian GDP uh, uh, being about fifteen hundred dollars at the moment. So that'd be fifteen dollars per capita in, in public financing. Um, now, I think the latest sort of benchmark figures, international figures. We're estimating you need about $86 per capita to fund the package of services available to all. And all the sort of the great UHC success stories that we see in, in Asia, Thailand, China, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, are all spending multiples of what India is spending. So, um, well, they are. Um, so, so uh, I mean, I think Thailand's about 5.1 now, China's about 3.2. China is, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. A, public, a, a public spending. And I, sp I suppose that, one would therefore ask, how how could India achieve universal health care? I mean, is the Indian health system somehow going to be five times more efficient than the Thai system, which we all all sort of marvel at? And really sort of put forward an, an alternative view, really, that, that the, the U India is so far from UHC because of the chronically low levels of public financing, and really that no politician has ever really taken it seriously, particularly at a national level. I know... You've got the Modi government who have come in now and have actually slashed public spending and are pushing the burden even further onto the states. And, you know, the, the, it would appear that India is, is as far from UHC as ever. But maybe there's a glimmer of hope uh, with the AAP in Delhi. Um, and I'm not sure if you've been following the, the developments there, who, who have gone for health in a huge way since the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. have opened 105 Mahala clinics across the city, mm -hmm. plowing money into free universal primary health care, mm -hmm. And th the, the population are responding with their feet, and you're seeing a huge increase in consumption of public health services. And basically, the model being more like what they're doing in Thailand. And it seems that you know that the the AAP government in Delhi are taking this line that you do need to ramp up public financing to pay for the doctors and nurses and medicines, and that that is basically the route to UHC, increasing public financing. But you're right, spending it on cost-effective primary health care. Sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, sorry. Okay, quick, quick response to that. Thank you for that question. Uh, well, Sri Lanka, the latest data is around 2% of GDP. China is 3%. Bangladesh is spending less than 1%, but having a better health, I mean, maximum mortality rate, infant mortality rate than India. So I use it in the context that we have neighbors who are actually spending low or similar to us in terms of the actual amount of money, but are doing much better. So, yes, the government change did make some change. In terms of inefficiency, let me give you an example, make it more lively. The recent health budget in India talked of providing renal dialysis center to all district hospitals. Just calculate the cost of that. And versus the opportunity cost of investing the money in primary preventive programs, which would prevent the risk factors for developing renal disease, death of diabetes and hypertension. So they're missing out a huge amount of money or the money is being invested in long, wrong priorities. So that's the point I'm trying to make here. So 1%, we can achieve much more than what we are currently achieving. We have a huge potential to do much more than that. If we invest. I'm going to let him have the last word. Thank you. In this. Uh, <laughs> did, did I? OK, I hope I, I answer your question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's also the issue of, of whether we're talking about uh, the sort of, you know, how comprehensive as well as how universal a system it is. So it's, I mean, it's, uh, there are several different, well, there are three, three major things. So. Um,
Apologies if this uh, question has already been asked. Um, with the election of Narendra Modi, who is arguably pursuing neoliberal agendas, how likely do you think universal health care is going to be um, implemented? And what can the individual do to kind of put pressure on the government? Because uh, as, uh, sorry, apologies, I thought, you know, Rob mentioned, in Delhi it's been very successful, but the AAP are aren't as popular yet. So how can in the rest of India, like how can people kind of put pressure on the government? Well, I can't answer for Narendra Modi, frankly speaking, <laughs> just to answer the question for Narendra Modi. But it brings in an important dynamic uh, in the Indian public sector, because certain states investing more in public health, like say the Delhi or let's say Tamil Nadu, and it brings in an interesting understanding of how different states function. I have a hypothesis, it may not be true, but states which have local regional parties in power have traditionally done good in healthcare administration. Let's take a state. Tamil Nadu, the, the party in power, power in Tamil Nadu has never been in the central power. It seems they have something to show to the rest of the country that we can do it. While states which have had the national party in power traditionally have not done so well in health administration. But this is a hypothesis worth exploring and researching further. Yeah, but you're, but you're right, there's the hope, isn't it? Yeah, there is hope, yeah. always hope. Hope is the strongest philosophy of the human mind, X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the, the, would you, do you have a question? Or just, uh, we'll make this the last one because we have uh, There was a point of clarification in terms of the training <coughs> with field practice, because you mentioned that there's um, research can take time but the practical side of it was an 18-week project, as far as I understand. So I wanted to clarify whether they have the research project beforehand, and then the 18 weeks is for turning the research into policy. No. <coughs> the research project, let me show you this slide. I'm sorry, I didn't explain it in the program. They have an independent research project, which they have to complete at the end of the fourth semester, finish the dissertation, but independent from their policy. Absolutely independent. They start working on the research right from the day one, they say, and they end up with the dissertation at four. So that's the academic part of it. But the field practicum is an independent exercise uh, inbuilt into the model, which is towards generating a policy for the different Indian sectors. So my question in terms of the policy brief would be, do you have any sense of how that is being turned into action? Yeah, very once good you've question. Turned it? Very good question. Thank you. I think that's something we will need to explore. And we have had these 17 policy briefs which we have created, and I showed you on the map. Three state government governments have come back to us saying that we would like to implement the recommendations which have come out of this policy brief. And I think it's a it's a small step, but it's a step in the right direction. Considering that it is a blank slate with no evidence at all, we have generated some evidence which could probably, hopefully, in the future, get translated into an implementable program. Inaction can be the action. But <laughs> have you any sense of the response of the decision makers to the support that you were giving them for that project? Because well, that would be a kind of intermediate way of evaluating how these things are evaluated. Yes, Do they think, is this really helpful? Is it helpful? Can we just sort of, you know, sort out in our minds what the issue is? Right. Yes, I think they have been very uh, interesting responses. And it also gives an idea of which states perhaps are more proactive and keen to listen to the academic that's an insight we got. And the fact that they have accepted our students and the faculty mentors, in fact, itself shows the openness of these states. And they're work starting on that. I think they're trying to go through the other stages, yes, but yes. absolutely they're they are happy about it. It doesn't cost them anything. The bottom line is finance them. Yes, yes. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.